All right. Good morning. Hello, everyone. My name is John Bateman, a public affairs officer with NOAA Communications, and I want to start by thanking you for joining us for today's announcement. Uh, we are here to get a first-hand look at a new update to NOAA's billion-dollar disasters mapping tool. The tool now drills down to the U.S. census tract level, providing fine-scale information about the risks and vulnerabilities that communities face due to increasing and increasingly costly extreme weather and climate disasters. And to give you a demonstration of the mapping tool, I'd like to welcome one of the primary architects of this project, Adam Smith, who is a billion dollar disasters expert with NOAA's National Centers for Environmental Information. Adam will give us a tour through the mapping tool and show us how to use it to understand how weather and climate hazards impact your local community. Afterwards, we will be happy to take your questions during our question and answer session where you can type your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Just a friendly reminder that today's Q&A is reserved for members of the media. And with that, I will turn it over to Adam with more. Adam? Thank you, John. Good day, everyone. I would like to first talk about macro to micro, what we had, what we've worked on, and now what the latest and greatest data are uh, in our NOAA Billion Dollar Disaster Mapping uh, Tool. So we bring together disaster risk, vulnerability data, um, really down to a community level, and we'll see some examples. Um, and so this is integrating hazard risk, socioeconomic vulnerability within the U.S. Billion Dollar Disaster Platform using data from FEMA, Census, and the CDC. So let's dive in. So this is building on one of the uh, more popular longstanding products at NOAA's National Center for Environmental Information, the U.S. Billion Dollar Weather and Climate Disaster uh, Analysis. Since 1980 through 2022, we do quarterly updates. We've analyzed 332 separate billion dollar or higher uh, events, inflation adjusted to present day dollars. And the cumulative cost is in excess of $2.2 trillion uh, for these uh, most costly damaging events. So just as a reminder, last year in 2021 was yet another active year, really in a series of years. We From 2017 through 2021 in particular, has just been nonstop uh, across many different extremes and hazards from coast to coast. You can see in the West, we had again, an active wildfire season precipitated by a, um, a, a growing persistent drought in the West. Uh, we also had another active hurricane season in 2021, particularly along the Gulf Coast with Hurricane Ida in particular, uh, and many severe convective storm events in the central states, but also a cold wave event in Texas, we all remember, and then a, a heat wave in the Pacific Northwest, um, which unfortunately took many lives and was very anomalous uh, based on climatology. This is this year's map in 2022 showing the first six months. And you can see we've already have a number of events, nine so far. Um, it's been uh, not quite as uh, intense as recent years, but of course we have the Western wildfire season, the continuous drought out West, and then another forecasted active hurricane season right at our doorstep. So certainly this picture is full, not fully painted yet for the nation. But today what we're talking about is uh, the newly integrated multi-hazard vulnerability mapping. Last um, December, we did this for the full U.S. for all the counties, so 3,100 plus counties. Now we've gone down another level of spatial granularity to the census tracts. Uh, this introduces more than 72,000 different census tracts across the nation. And the census tract on average has about 44,200 people and is, is relatively um, uh, consistent over space and time. So it's a good metric. And what makes this product unique is it's integrating over 100 different combinations of the extremes we analyze in the billion dollar disaster platform, hurricanes, severe storm events, including tornado, hail, damaging wind events, um, inland urban flooding events, drought heat wave events, wildfires, winter storm and freeze cold wave events. So you can look at these hazards individually or in any combination. Um, and, and in addition to the hazards themselves and how often those occur historically, of course, there's what's on the ground, people, assets, building value, agricultural value, um, which is exposed, that's the exposure, but also the vulnerability of these assets and lives and livelihoods. Um, and one newer example of the data would be um, from the Census uh, American Community Survey 
CDC's social vulnerability index builds on that. And we've um, captured about a dozen different socioeconomic variables at the county and the census tract level um, to show this data in more uh, detail. So quickly, uh, as an example from last December, this is the U.S. county map. And you could see if, at the top, if you select a drought plus wildfire plus flood hazard, you could see the U.S. Southwest is where the combined hazard for is is the highest. The darker the shade of the color, the higher the risk. Um, and we've seen a lot of these types of um, cascading or compound hazard events, which happen in tighter space time frequency, which makes recovery more costly and more difficult for populations. Um, also, as a, a national climate assessment noted, um, these compound extreme events are actually greater than the sum of their parts uh, as far as when they happen back to back to back. You see in, in the West, we have drought, which often enhances and makes wildfire season more uh, destructive. Then in the wet season, after the wildfire season, we get heavy rain atmospheric river events often in the West Coast, which can make debris flows, mud flows more damaging, more destructive. So these disasters can compound and add on one another. Um, let's go to the next slide. So here's an, a, a different example. This shows tornado plus hail plus high wind derecho events combined. And as you'd expect, east of the Rockies is where the geography for these hazards really stands out. Um, what we have highlighted here is Dallas County, Texas, actually has the highest risk for um, these hazards across the nation because a lot of exposure, population, building value, a lot of um, you know, high, high frequency of these events that happened regularly across um, the Dallas-Fort Worth area and, and the vulnerability because of the exposure is high. And you can click on any of these counties or census tracts, as you'll see, and get a lot more of information. This is just kind of showing a top level view. Uh, another view would be, this would be tropical cyclones, which are of course hurricane events and tropical storm events. And you can see, you know, from Texas to New England, even well inland, there is um, tropical cyclone risk, particularly as hurricanes come in and rain themselves out like we saw last year with Hurricane Ida from Louisiana all the way through New York, New Jersey, et cetera. And tropical cyclones, of course, are the most costly of the hazards we analyze in excess of $1.2 trillion since 1980 with an average event cost of 21 billion per event um, in present day dollars. And you can see Tom, Palm Beach County highlighted there has a pretty high relative score. And all these um, counties and census tracts, as you will see, uh, are um, analyzed compared to all counties or all census tracts across the nation. Um, so it's apples to apples. Uh, one more real quick county map. You can see how Harris County, Texas there highlighted, which is home to Houston, for just heavy rain urban flood events has the highest risk there. Similar to Dallas County, uh, you know, a lot of large population, a lot of exposure, a lot of vulnerability. And of course, it's been prone to many uh, destructive uh, 100 plus year urban flood events, uh, independent of what happened with Hurricane Harvey. But as you can see, much of the nation has a uh, relatively high flood risk. And so we wanted to, with the census tract data, allow users to really drill down more by integrating different data sources. So uh, before we go to the census tracts, I wanted to highlight that if you were to click Harris County, Texas from the previous map, this is what you would see. You would get some, actually more than this, you would get the data comparing the hazard risk for drought, for flooding, for severe storm, for all of the billion dollar disaster hazards, how that county's uh, combined hazard risk compared to the average county risk for the state it exists in versus all of the counties across the entire nation. And you can see, and certainly Harris County, Texas tops the list in a few of these categories, flooding, severe storm, and tropical cyclone risk is, is quite pronounced. Even winter storm risk, again, as we, were, we are reminded what happened in February of 2021 with the cold wave um, frozen grid incident. So, uh, it, you know, Texas, like a lot of places in the South and the Southeast are really prone to many different hazards. So this is an example of some of the newer data from the uh, Census American Community Survey through the CDC Social Vulnerability Index. These, this is 15 different um, metrics that on the right, we have chosen 11 of the 15 um, because we thought uh, the, the 11 that we chose, which I'll highlight, are most salient to uh, the hazards we're trying to highlight here. And so I'll show some examples here shortly. Um, also, in addition, you can see how, uh, so for Harris County, Texas, in addition to the hazard risk scores I mentioned on the right, 
uh, excuse me, on the left, on the right, you can see the socioeconomic vulnerabilities, which are, of course, very important to understand uh, how, how the population demographics are and how vulnerable or maybe resilient they are to different hazards. And these are the 11 variables from the social vulnerability index as a percentage of the full population of the county that we have pulled into the database. Um, and as you can see here, comparing, for example, on the left, uh, the percent of each county that has a that has mobile home as a as a resident versus the percent of population for each county that lives in poverty, you can see there's a lot of spatial uh, correlation there, particularly in the southeast. And you know, why that matters with hazards are that you know high wind are uh, high wind events like tornadoes, derechos, of course hurricanes, are you know not not good for uh, if you were to shelter in a mobile home, for instance. So you would probably need to evacuate if you want to um, be safe. And so it's, it's combined the hazards, the exposure, the vulnerability with different socioeconomic dimensions. We're pulling all that together to allow you users to see uh, kind of what the risk is for um, their place of interest. So now, finally, let's get to some of the newer information. So now we're looking at the state of uh, North Carolina and at the tropical cyclone risk in shades of yellow. Again, darker yellow indicates higher tropical cyclone, i.e. hurricane risk, which you, as you would expect is mostly along the coast, uh, but it goes pretty well inland. Um, but what, what you can see here in the kind of the southeastern portion of the, the state, I've got a small sense tract 115 highlighted, and you can see how it uh, has a, a tropical cyclone risk score of 59.28, which is substantially higher than the county it, it resides in, New Hanover County, which is also higher than the average North Carolina risk, and et cetera, et cetera. And so we're, we're building on this type of deeper granularity, and I'll provide more information here. So if you were to click on that census tract, and I believe North Carolina has something like 2,000 different census tracts, you would get this type of information on the left. You would get, as I shared with Harris County, you would get... Um, the risk score for the seven different uh, hazards in the billion dollar disaster database for the, the nation, the state, the county, but now also the census tract. And you can see if it's higher or lower than the, the county or the state that, that, that you exist in. But more importantly, also the socioeconomic vulnerabilities there in the right here, um, how the census tract compares to uh, the county. So percent of population below poverty uh, per capita income, which is the kind of the inverse of that. Um, no high school diploma, disabled population, no vehicle, for, for example, to evacuate, uh, minority population, single parent households. So, so certain variables that may make uh, responding to uh, a hazardous event more difficult. So all that data is pulled together now um, in this framework. Let's go to the next slide. So to wrap it up in the next five or six slides, I'm going to actually give you a deeper example. So now we're looking at uh, Louisiana. As we know, over the last several years, unfortunately, Louisiana has, kind of like the U.S. Southwest, really been an epicenter of cascading compound hazards, back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back hurricanes. Um, you know, last year, again, Hurricane Ida, a strong Cat 4. The year before that, Hurricane Laura, also a Cat 4. Um, so, and, and there were other hurricanes and, um, and tropical storms as well. So, here's, again, showing the tropical cyclone risk for Louisiana and we have highlighted here Plaquemines Parish and also tracked 504 within the parish. And just like North Carolina, uh, you can see how in particular the tracked 504 is more than three times as risky for hurricane uh, exposure and vulnerability than the parish it resides in. So that's an important piece of information. Also note that we have a slider on data opacity at the top, which is important to see uh, the data. You can zoom into your, to your house or your neighborhood with this map. Um, so if you use that slider, um, and we're going to give an example here for the New Orleans area in the box right here, uh, you can you know, zoom into New Orleans just like this, and still you can see how many of the census tracts are very small, so you can zoom in much more closely than what I'm doing right here. But uh, what I've got highlighted here is census tract 1751, uh, and uh, and, and I'm going to compare it against all the other census tracts using the SVI data. So here, let's see what this census tract looks like in the New Orleans, New Orleans metro area. So for hurricane hazard, uh, the census tract 1751 is quite uh, quite.
quite high risk. So it's high average annual loss from hurricanes, high exposure, population values to be destroyed uh, potentially, but also high socioeconomic vulnerability. So again, the darker colors are worse. Uh, it means higher uh, vulnerability. Lighter colors are uh, better resilience, lower vulnerability. So you see in the Eastern Louisiana Metro, a lot of darker colors. So let's uh, look at some other metrics. So for example, if you were to click on the top left menu above the new map under socioeconomic vulnerabilities from the SVI uh, census ACS data, below poverty, you see almost 80% of the population in this census tract are below poverty compared to only about 24 and a half percent of the entire Orleans parish. So, you know, if you're an emergency manager, you know, that's, that's one thing uh, to be aware of. Uh, you probably already actually know that, but still you can see spatially how different parts of this city uh, compare uh, in terms of below poverty using the, the data that we've integrated. Let's look at another measure, income. So this is uh, you know, the opposite of poverty. So you can see how the income is, is low here, uh, under $10,000 per capita, which is less than a third of the Orleans Parish. Um, and, and here actually is the darker colors for income actually indicate higher income. But let's check another uh, metric out. So here would be disabled population. So this is an important metric to look at. Uh, nearly a third of the population, according to this data, 30% is disabled. And you can see how that for the census tract here in the New Orleans metro area is quite quite a bit higher than the, the other um, census tracts, the other areas within New Orleans metro area. And finally, uh, so no vehicle, again, to, to uh, evacuate, um, maybe New Orleans can, can use more local uh, facilities, for example, and people could just walk and not have to evacuate or they could get on a bus to evacuate. But this type of information, of course, is also useful to see what parts of the city uh, have higher levels of no vehicle access uh, or any of these different socioeconomic vulnerabilities we're highlighting here. So this is one of almost an infinite number of combinations that you could look at in this new mapping. And um, I'd be happy to, to take some questions. And, and this is kind of just a start with our partners at Census and CDC and FEMA to further uh, make this information more useful. Thank you. All right, Adam, thank you uh, so much, Adam, for that very nice deep dive into the information. Um, we are sure that there are some folks out there eager to ask questions about this new mapping tool. So. If you are, we just want to remind everyone that if you'd like to ask a question, please type your question into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please be sure to type your full name and organization when asking your question so that we may best respond to your inquiry. And just remember uh, that this time is reserved for media questions only, please. And we will wait and see if we have any questions. If not, we will wrap up this presentation. Give us just a few minutes. Here we go. It looks like we have a question here uh, from Bill Waddell from AccuWeather. Thanks, Bill. Uh, how can we get a video recording of this briefing? Good question. Actually, a video recording of this briefing will be online on the media advisory later this afternoon. We're gonna be getting that up as soon as possible. So uh, stick around for that. Hopefully it won't take very long. Um, another one, Zach Coleman from Politico. All right, Adam, we had a question here. Is there any way to bring up federal disaster spending by census tract? That's a good question. I do not think that we have currently the data at the census tract level. I, I have not looked at that. Um, I know it exists at county and state level for many different hazards. And that's actually an example of something we could also add to in the future to this mapping. So that's an excellent question. But uh, the census tract level information, I'm, I'm personally not aware of that. Okay, thank you, Adam. It looks like we have another question here. This one from uh, Rebecca Hersher uh, from NPR. Uh, she was wondering, does the flooding risk category include both storm surge and rain related flooding? Yeah, there are a few, few different flood components. Um, yeah. It, it, the, the, what we're looking at in this particular mapping would be the heavy rain, extreme rainfall, or snow melt, uh, river basin flooding, urban flooding. Um, also with tropical cyclone hurricane events, we have the storm surge through the work from FEMA's NRI also integrated within that. Uh, the only type of hazard we have not yet added to this mapping would be 
uh, non-storm coastal flooding from uh, sunny day high tide flooding events, that is available. We have not yet added that only because that's traditionally not a billion dollar disaster type event yet, but um, uh, stay tuned, that may be added also in the future. Okay, wonderful, thank you, Adam. Uh, it does not look like we have any other questions at this time. Uh, again, if you would like to ask a question, all you have to do is type your question into the Q&A box at the bottom of the uh, screen here. And if we, okay, looks like we may have perhaps one more. Okay, uh, a follow-up question from Rebecca Hersher from NPR. Uh, Adam, can you say more about why you chose these uh, 11 socioeconomic vulnerability criteria and why you decided not to use a couple of other ones? The choice was more to frame the data in terms of what seemed like the most obvious connections uh, in terms of you know how emergency managers would like to to look at information in terms of uh, socioeconomic vulnerabilities for hazards i think it's a fair question uh, the four we did not include for example um crowded housing we could easily add those um i think it was a matter of kind of a, a signal to noise ratio type uh, thought uh, but but perhaps we should add the other four as well. Yeah, and that's a good thing to add to this, Adam, that uh, this is going to be kind of a living uh, site that's going to continually be updated and, and we'll let folks know as we add those up, uh, updates. But because um, we're always uh, always looking for new suggestions as to what we can add to help folks. Um, thank you. We have another question. It looks like it is a Neil uh, Danesha from Vox. Uh, the question is, Adam, it looks like your system doesn't have a filter for heat, but heat contributes to hazards like drought and wildfires, as well as health impacts. Are there plans to add heat? So actually, we do have heat combined with drought impacts. Um, it, you're right, it's not uh, quite clear the way it's conveyed in the mapping right now. But yes, we do combine heat wave impacts with drought impacts which are not always, you know, happen in the same space-time event, but that is included. All right, good to know. Thank you, Adam. Uh, I'm not seeing any more questions at this point, but again, if you do want to ask a question, we still do have some time. It looks like we may have one. Okay. Rebecca, a uh, follow-up question uh, from Rebecca. Uh, Adam, you mentioned that many emergency managers will already know the basic info about who is most at risk from disasters in their place. Can you talk more about who is the target audience for this tool and what will this tool enable? Yeah, I think there are many target audiences for this tool. Um, you know, even looking at your own census tract or your own county, it's interesting to see how um, the vulnerability within where you live versus around where you live changes. Um, so literally anyone could find uh, this tool and the way we've integrated the information and made it quite simple, uh, useful just from a pure informational perspective. Or if you live near the coast or uh, in a hurricane season, you know, a hurricane is coming your way or hopefully a wildfire event is not coming your way in the West Coast. Um, you know, I think a, a community planner, maybe a mayor, business owners, all, all these different bodies with interest and in decision-making capabilities could find this integrated, relatively simple interface useful for really quick information. All right, great. Thank you so much, Adam. Um, I don't see any more questions. I will wait just a, a couple of more seconds if we have anybody that wants to ask any. Again, if you would like to, you can just go into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. And it does not look like I'm seeing any at this point. And if that's the case, then uh, we can start wrapping this up. So uh, first of all, I want to thank all of you for learning more about this update to the Billion Dollar Disasters Mapping Tool today. Uh, we hope you'll find the data valuable for your reporting. Thank you, Adam, for giving us a demonstration on how this tool can be used. And again, a recording of today's demonstration will be available on our online media advisory shortly, uh, hopefully by later this afternoon. Oh, as I'm wrapping up, maybe we had really one quick one. Oh, okay, there we go. Uh, uh, and, and Rebecca says, thank you. So before we quickly go, Adam, we do have time. One more, Grace Ferguson asked, is there a way to embed this tool into say a, a news article? Well, currently the URL, um, which is at the end of the presentation, um, <laughs> you can see there, you could use that. Um, right now we haven't fully added other technological capabilities to make that more automated, but um, you know, some simple screenshots. Uh, it's, it's pretty high quality map, I think would complement uh, news stories um, if you were to go that route. 
Awesome. And uh, thank, thank you, Adam, and thank you, Grace. Uh, I'm gonna continue to wrap this up. Adam, if you don't mind going to the next uh, slide, I believe we have some more contact information on there uh, after this one more, thank you. There you go, that's more information that's on your screen. Um, and I wanted to mention again, a recording of today's demonstration will be available on our online media advisory shortly this afternoon. And our press release with links to the mapping tool is available now on NOAA.gov in the news section. And finally, if you have any follow-up questions, please contact me at john.jonesbateman at NOAA.gov. You can also call me at 202-424-0929. This uh, concludes today's announcement. Thanks so much for joining us.